Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, the Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire. Episode 27, Rurik, and what is the tale of bygone years anyway? Welcome back everyone. I hope you had a great holiday season and start to 2023. I have a couple of new patrons to thank, State Councillor Ian and, entering the Hall of Fame, His Imperial Majesty, Tsar Muhammad. My sincere thanks for all your great support. I hope to have some merch coming soon for patrons too, so keep an eye out for that. Okay, we have a lot of great stuff coming up this year, so let's get into it. Today, we will be starting on a chronological history of Rus and its rulers. The key source for this period is a set of chronicles that were written a few centuries later, often known as the Russian Primary Chronicle, but better rendered as the Tale of Bygone Years, not least because they are mostly not about Russia. We will be looking at what the tale says and comparing what is written there to the other evidence and analysis by modern historians to try to get to what the true story is. So, before we turn to Rus' first ruler, Rurik, I want to take a bit of time first for two questions. One, the question of names once again. And two, what is the tale of bygone years? The first question of names is, what do we call the people we are going to be talking about now? What people and places are called can have different meanings or implications. There is a Russian imperialist history of Rus. There is a Ukrainian nationalist history of Rus. Many of you will be aware that Russians and Ukrainians often have similar but different names. At least you will have seen President Vladimir Putin of Russia and President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine. Zelensky used to be Vladimir too, and I think we all know why he has changed the way he refers to himself. There are plenty of other examples. Alek or Ole, Iga or Iko, Olga or Olha. So, if we're talking about Vladimir the Great of Rus, is he Vladimir or Volodymyr? The answer might actually be both or neither. The tale of bygone years calls him Volodymyr, that's with an E in the last syllable rather than an I or Y, but still close to modern Ukrainian. As I say, it was written much later. Vladimir himself issued coins that call him Vladimir, written similar to the Russian style. Maybe that was just aimed at his subjects. It's quite possible that to his family and closest retainers, Vladimir was Valdemar in the Scandinavian style. So there is no correct way to refer to him as such. It is not kowtowing to the Russian imperialist version of history to call him Vladimir, and calling him Volodymyr does not mean you are accepting a Ukrainian nationalist version of history in which, say, there is no connection between Rus and Russia. The Eastern Slavic languages will diverge into Russian and Ukrainian and others during the existence of Rus. So we cannot say that any one version of the names in their modern equivalents is the sole correct one. For me, if Vladimir was what he put on his coins, that's good enough for me, and that's what I will call him. From now until Rus starts to break up, I'm generally going to follow the names more traditionally used in English. As noted above, although these names may be closer to modern Russian, they are not Russian, and this does not reflect any opinion on the Russianness of Rus. I'll be mentioning the alternative versions of names, ones closer to modern Ukrainian or Scandinavian origins, 
as we go along, and as Rus starts to break up, I'll be using the Ukrainian versions for people from the regions that go on to become part of Ukraine. For place names, I'll still be following the approach I set out at the beginning of the podcast, but let's just talk about what we call Rus, the people that live in it, and the titles of the people that rule it. There are a number of ways of referring to Rus. You've probably heard of Kievan Rus. Russians also call it the ancient Rus state. Some scholars call it medieval Rus, a few the kingdom of Rus. We'll come back to that. As you've probably noticed, I've simply been calling it Rus. Why not Kievan Rus? Back when I was an undergrad, talking about Kievan Rus was a major no-no. No one in Rus called it Kievan Rus. The name comes from the Russian imperialist school of history. It was introduced with the argument that there was a single continuous entity that started in Rus and ended in the Russian Empire. In this narrative, Rus was called Kievan to indicate that it was just a stage, a stepping stone on the way to Moscow's rule. We'll give some consideration later to if or how Moscow is the heir to Rus, but if you've missed it so far, spoiler alert, Rus is not Russia. Recently, I've seen Kievan Rus revived with the opposite meaning, especially among Ukrainians on social media. In this sense, Rus is called Kievan to assert that it belongs to Ukraine, often going along with the claim that Muscovy stole Rus history. Also give some consideration to if or how Ukraine is the heir to Rus, but it probably hasn't escaped your notice that Gorodysh, Novgorod, Stare, Ladoga, Rostov, Veliki, Vladimir, and other places that we've only mentioned in passing are not and never have been in Ukraine. And that's not even getting into the question of Belarus, which we haven't really mentioned yet. So, I'm not going to be using Kievan Rus unless I'm quoting someone else. In this podcast, I'm just going to call it Rus, and I'm taking the position that it is not Russia or Ukraine. Rus is its own thing, a country that no longer exists, that was in some senses a predecessor of each of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. I'm going to call the people the Rus. You can often see them called Rusians with no double S in books, but I think that can be confusing in an audio format. So Rus and the Rus, or sometimes the Kingdom of Rus, once it's united. What's that you say? Rus didn't have kings, it had princes and grand princes or dukes, depending on which translation you like. Well, let's have a talk about that too. If Vladimir or Yaroslav were princes or dukes rather than kings, who were they subordinate to? After all, that's the implication, right? That a prince is somehow lesser than a king? Although Rus was bigger and more populous than any European country ruled by anyone we call a king, and Kiev was bigger than London or Paris? Well, what we have here is kind of a problem of retroactive mistranslation probably with some later politics thrown into the mix. In the middle of the 16th century, English sailors were exploring the world's oceans looking for new or faster trade routes. One expedition was stranded in the Russian north and ended up in Moscow, leading to the foundation of the Muscovy Company and the opening of trade between Moscow and England. This led to an expansion of trade and diplomatic relations between England and Muscovy, and one ambassador to Moscow, Giles Fletcher the Elder, wrote a book called Of the Rus Commonwealth, providing a detailed description of the faraway country. He describes it as ruled by a Tsar, and under the Tsar were nobles, often of the same family, and many of them, as he writes, younger sons of younger sons, with no inheritance besides their title. These nobles, he says, are called knyaz, which he translates as duke, 
by analogy with English noble titles. Following this, Knyaz was routinely translated into English as Duke, with a shift towards using Prince in the 20th century. But while this might have been a reasonable translation for Muscovy and Russia, we're not talking about them, we are talking about Rus. Just as a starting point, there was no Tsar in Rus, so we should not unquestioningly project the situation from centuries later back into the Middle Ages. Actually, when I say that, I'm rather understating the problem. The contemporaries of Rus all called the Knyazes kings, Rex or Kornung, depending on what language they were using. But modern translators of their texts simply change king to duke. A review of the historiography by historian Christian Slaffenberg, a specialist in Rus, provides example after example of this happening. Actually, I'm still understating. It gets worse than that. Historians and translators not only substitute duke for king, they editorialize around it. Erling Momsen's translation of the Heimskringler, which we discussed in the members' episode on the Varangians, calls Vladimir Yaroslav and Vsevolod king, but adds a footnote saying duke, implying that the text was mistaken. The translator of Henry of Livonia, who wrote a history of the Baltic Crusades, adds notes that the king, in quotes, of Polotsk, was actually a Russian prince, and that Vladimir was a Russian prince, not a king, as Henry calls him. One might wonder how Henry would have made such a mistake, given that he was writing at the time of the events, and often from his own or eyewitness accounts. And again, who was the king if Vladimir was a prince? Time and time again, in text after text, the title in the source, King, is replaced with a lower title. Implicitly, and sometimes entirely explicitly, is suggested that the source is wrong. Rus rulers were not kings, and therefore they were not the equals of the kings of England or France or other kingdoms. Modern historians have become more sensitive to this kind of deliberate downgrading and what it might mean. One example is the way any kind of nomad is called a tribe rather than a people or nation, and their ruler is called a chief rather than a king. In imperialist histories, this kind of naming has for centuries created the perception that others are inferior and primitive and therefore deserve to be conquered and ruled. There is another case which has been coming up all the way through this podcast, Byzantium. I call it Byzantium to avoid confusing people, especially as there are already so many unfamiliar peoples and names in this podcast. But I think we should all be aware that they continued to call themselves Romans. Byzantium is a name that was originally invented by other people who specifically wanted to deny that the Eastern Romans were Romans. Although Byzantium has been enjoying something of a resurgence in the last couple of decades, the result was that they were largely written out of history in the West and treated as something different to, rather than a continuation of Rome, while other Western European countries took the mantle of Rome for themselves. Think about your own conception of medieval Europe. Is it about England and France? maybe the Pope, English and French knights going on crusade at the behest of the Pope? Is there a place for Hungary or Serbia? Is Prague on your list of major centres of learning? There has been a process of downgrading the significance of Central and Eastern Europe, sometimes deliberately. One of the most influential recent books on the Middle Ages, which I referenced back in the episodes comparing Eastern Europe with Western Europe after the Romans, is Framing the Early Middle Ages by Chris Wickham. Purportedly a new interpretation of Europe after Rome, its narrative rightly includes North Africa, the Levant, and Byzantium, certainly part of the Roman and post-Roman world, but it excludes the lands populated by Slavs. What Europe includes 
North Africa and doesn't include Ukraine. We'll think back to that discussion of similarities between Eastern and Western Europe in the episodes on Khazaria and the Eastern Slavs. Does medieval mean feudal to you? There are historians that would argue that feudalism is a stage in the development of France and the neighbours it influenced, but it does not describe the situation in the rest of Europe. In this podcast, medieval Europe will include Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, and of course the Kingdom of Rus. As we continue through the story of its development, I will continue to show how it is related and integrated into the rest of Europe. And to say it for the hundredth time, there was no Eastern Europe and Western Europe. We still haven't got to the invention of Western Europe. So, to loop back, Knyaz, which contemporary chroniclers writing in Latin in neighbouring countries always rendered as Rex, had the original meaning of king, and that's what I would call the rulers of Rus. It was originally the title of the man who performed the role, not a hereditary title. Later in Russia, the meaning of the title will change from what it was in Rus. It will become a hereditary title, indicating a connection to the royal family, irrespective of whether the person performs any role in governance. So I will call the Russian knyazes princes. And in case you're wondering, Fletcher translated Tsar as Emperor. So, with that out of the way, let's turn to our next question. You will all have heard me referring to the tale of bygone years, also known as the Russian Primary Chronicle, and we are now going to be largely following its framework in the coming episodes. But what is the tale of bygone years, and where does it come from? The first thing to know is that there is no tale of bygone years as such. No one has a manuscript or book of that name, what we have is a varied collection of codices written down between the 14th and 17th centuries. That is, two to five hundred years after the chronicle itself was supposedly written. This is where the variety of names comes from. You might see it referred to as the Chronicle of Nestor, the Primary Chronicle, the Russian Primary Chronicle, the Kievan Primary Chronicle, or the Rus Primary Chronicle. You should know enough by now to see that some of those names have nationalist connotations. The various versions have large areas of overlap, but are sometimes contradictory and have been written with differing propagandistic purposes. But they all begin with basically the same story. In this story, which is largely lifted from Byzantine sources and adapted to Rus, you can learn a bit more about that in the members episode on Cyril and Methodius. We start off with the history of the Slavs descending from Japheth, the third son of Noah. Then we get an overview of how we got from the Bible to the Slavs. And then it switches from an ethnic history to a history of the Rurikid dynasty. The Rurikids are the descendants of Rurik. At the same time, it switches from a grand narrative to a proper chronicle, setting out events year by year as it covers the foundation, expansion, and Christianization of Rus. The chronicle then breaks off in the year 1110. Of the numerous manuscripts, the five big ones are the Laurentian Codex, which was produced for Dmitry Konstantinovich of Suzdal in 1377. The Hypatian Codex, which is of unknown origin but probably Pskov, copied down in around 1425. The Radzul Codex, illustrated manuscripts with hundreds of colourful miniatures, which was created at the end of the 15th century. The Academy Codex, which was likely made for the rulers of Rostov in the late 15th century, 
and the Hlipnikov Codex, a 16th century text the famous Russian historian Nikolai Karamzin found in a merchant's private collection. These codices are all copies of copies of copies and of partial texts. They can have multiple authors. The first 40 pages of the Laurentian Codex are written in a single column in unsealed letters in the oldest style of Cyrillic. Unseal means the rounded, not joined up letters that you might have seen in early medieval manuscripts. The other 130 pages are written in double column pages in a semi unsealed script by a monk named Lavrenti, who signed his name on the last page and gives the codex his name. He helpfully notes that he started copying the text on 14th of January 1377 and completed it on 20th of March. Scholars believe that Lavrenti copied a compilation made in Tver in 1305, which was based on the version made in Rostov 50 to 70 years earlier. The Rostov version was based on compilations made for Andrei Bogolyubsky in Vladimir at the end of the 12th century by people working from a chronicle from Pereslavl and the Pereslavl version was based on a compilation made 50 years before that in the monasteries of Kiev. So we are talking about a dozen writers over almost 300 years in different cities with different rulers and perhaps with different aims in mind. Naturally, when we get to the age of modern historiography, historians are going to be asking who wrote the original chronicles, where and when, what sources did they have? Why were they written? What changes have been made? What is true and what isn't? If we don't have those original chronicles, what can we actually know? Cast your mind back to episode 22, Normanists and Anti-Normanists. You will recall... Gerhard Friedrich Müller and his bombshell lecture, which took the story of Rurik in the tale of bygone years as its starting point. Müller also invited another young German, a linguist called August Ludwig von Schlotzer, to come to St. Petersburg to work with him. Schlotzer was from a family of Protestant clergymen. He spoke Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and he had studied theology and Eastern languages at Göttingen University. At the time, Göttingen was pioneering a modern approach to history, emphasizing source criticism, methods that had not been applied in Russia before he arrived. Müller provided Schlotzer with a vast collection of manuscripts that he had been gathering across Russia for 30 years, and Schlotter soon abandoned all his plans for travels further east, started making excuses to get out of the geographical and statistical studies he'd been invited to Russia for, and devoted himself to studying Slavic languages and the chronicles. He would later write, looking back, quote, I saw around me an abundant harvest, untouched by the sickle, and no one but me could harvest it so soon. To be the first publisher and commentator of the chronicles of the most populous, most powerful, and most formidable country in Europe, was it possible to consider that a trifling matter? End quote. There was no school of philological research in Russia, and scholars were simply treating the chronicles as fact. Schlotter decided to apply the same textual analysis that scholars in Göttingen had started using for classical texts and the New Testament. Three years later, he published an article demonstrating that the opening section of the chronicle was adapted from Byzantine sources. Thirty years after that, he published a five-volume study, the first modern critical edition of a medieval chronicle. Schlotter accepted the general Russian belief that the first chronicle had been written in Kiev by a monk named Nestor. But when he compared the twenty-odd versions that he had in his possession, he found that they were quite different. And he didn't stint in his blame. 
deriding ignorant monks of the Middle Ages who introduced stupid mistakes, fabrications, nonsense, miracles, and fairy tales into the texts. He decided that by comparing the texts word by word, he could eliminate these accretions and restore the pristine original. And that is what he believed that he had done. This was a truly pioneering work. Schlotze was the first scholar to apply this kind of comparative linguistic methodology to a medieval text, and it would go on to become the standard approach. But, on the other hand, Schlotze was still a man of his time. The scholars of Göttingen, who had started to develop these techniques on classical works, were looking for the true Homer, not trying to prove that there was a Homer. Schlotze similarly never doubted that the original chronicle was the work of a single author, a lone genius working from scratch without previous texts, and the subsequent versions were all distortions of that original. Times were changing, though. While Schlotze was preparing his masterwork, just a couple of years before he published it, Another Göttingen University scholar dropped a bombshell study that would revolutionize textual analysis. Prolegomena ad Homerum by Friedrich August Wolff put forward the claim, never before heard, that there was never any Homer. Rather than the blind poet genius, he argued that the Iliad and the Odyssey were created by numerous poets working over centuries in an oral tradition and only cobbled together into the text that we know much later. There was no lone creator genius. There was a tradition of collecting and copying and changing. It took a couple of decades for this approach to penetrate Russia, where a Moscow historian called Pavel Stroyev was the first to use it. In an introduction to the Sofia Chronicle from Novgorod, Stroyev put forward the hypothesis that the scribes who produced the chronicle had based it on local eyewitness accounts gathered in various towns. These accounts had been gathered for years but were not retained. Like Schlotzer, he thought that the surviving chronicles were the work of ignorant monks, but he accused them of simply copying out ports without thought or consideration, and he introduced the term zborniki, collections or compilations to describe the chronicles. Now, you might not immediately see the implications of this, but it actually completely upends the study of the chronicles. Rather than trying to find the original chronicle, as Schlotter had been doing, historians were now looking instead for the source of the chronicle, the materials that had been used to create it. Soon, historians were finding different things in different parts of the chronicles. Besides Byzantine history and oral traditions, they saw Scandinavian legends, folk songs, materials from Bulgaria, and other sources. This led to a conceptualization of the chronicles as a combination of early annals, those eyewitness reports, and independent tales, literary works like the coming of Rurik, the founding of the Caves Monastery in Kiev, the martyrdom of Boris and Glib, and other sections. There was no longer any problem with the various manuscripts being contradictory. They had all been written by different people, in different places, based on different sources. So that was quite natural and to be expected. And so the study of the Chronicles progressed through the 19th century until the appearance of a new scholar, someone who arguably remains the key scholar of the Chronicles to this day. Alexei Shakhmatov was born in Narva, now Estonia, but grew up with his uncle near Saratov. He went to school in Moscow, where he got into Old Russian and literature. By 16, he was publishing articles in leading academic journal The Archive of Slavic Philology. By 18, still a schoolboy, he was being invited to Moscow University as a linguistic authority. He received his PhD at 25 for a dissertation on Russian phonetics 
and at 30 he became the youngest member of the Academy of Sciences. In 1906 he became the Academy's representative on the State Council of Imperial Russia. Along the way he edited the Russian Dictionary, oversaw the Academy's linguistic journals, and took three years off to serve as a local administrator. Following the February 1917 revolution, he was appointed to the Commission for the Study of the Tribal Composition of the Population of the Borderlands of Russia, and prepared a major reform of written Russian that was later implemented by the Bolsheviks. The orthography he developed is still in use today. If you're looking at pre-revolutionary and contemporary Russian and you think some of the letters are different, they actually are, and it was Shakhmatov that did that. As many intellectuals fled Russia following the revolution, he refused to go. And as a result, he died in St. Petersburg from malnutrition and overwork. He was only 56 years old. But we are interested in his connection with the Chronicles. So as I said, since his school days, he had been fascinated by Old Russian, and it became his lifelong study. He worked on Proto-Slavonic and tried to reconstruct Early Russian and determine its origins. What texts were available to scholars studying Early Russian? Why, the Chronicles, of course. Shakhmatov began to think about the fragmentary documents in the same way that he approached linguistics, and decided that it would be possible to reconstruct the Svodi, the collections of eyewitness reports, by systematically comparing the chronicles. He spent 25 years doing exactly that, applying etymological, phonetic, grammatical, orthographic, literary and historical analysis, eventually resulting in the publication of Investigations into the Most Ancient Russian Chronicle Compilations and some other works that were only published after his death. A key difference between Shakhmatov's model of the Chronicles and the previous conceptions is the difference between Zvordi and Zborniki. In the Zborniki model, the so-called primary chronicle was the first collection of materials from disparate sources, local reports, Byzantine histories, or folk tales. For Shakhmatov, it was not the primary chronicle, it was the ultimate chronicle the result of revisions to many previous and no longer existing versions of the Chronicles. Rather than being a gradual accumulation of sources, Shakhmatov thought that each one of the monks who had set out to produce a version of the Chronicle was a history writer creating a new version of the past to fit the political requirements of their time. They did not merely copy or collect, They considered all of the material available, selected the parts that fitted their needs, and shaped the narrative. So, not only were the chronicles and source materials viewed in a new light, the chroniclers themselves were also reconceptualized. Shakhmatov saw three versions of the Rus primary chronicle made in Kiev in the 12th century one written by the already mentioned Nestor at the Monastery of the Caves, another by Abbot Sylvester at St. Michael's Monastery in Vidobici, and another by an anonymous monk, again at the Monastery of the Caves. Shakhmatov compared these to the Novgorodian First Chronicle and decided that they were all derived from a common source text, which he called the Initial Compilation. But study of the initial compilation persuaded him that there had been another compilation before that, which he believed was written in the Monastery of the Caves in the 11th century. Still further study led him to identify another compilation, which he dubbed the most ancient Kievan compilation, and dated to 1039. This date links to the building of St. Sophia, and he argued that the authors were the clerics of the new cathedral, who were instructed to write the first native history by the new Greek metropolitan. All the other Svodi were also assigned precise dates 
that tied to major events in Rus' history in the same kind of way. Shakhmatov even produced a complete reconstruction of the most ancient Kievan compilation, which was published as an appendix to the investigations, something that always reminds me, perhaps spuriously, of the appendices to the Lord of the Rings. 20th century studies of the Chronicles were largely either following or reacting against Shakhmatov. His hypotheses have been questioned more since the fall of the Soviet Union, but in many ways scholars still have to take a position for or against him when they produce their own theories. The most interesting recent work on the subject for me is by a historian named Sean Griffin, who has been examining the influence of the Byzantine liturgy on the Chronicles. An Orthodox Christian himself, he argues that most scholars, including Shakhmatov, have overlooked this key influence entirely simply because as non-religious people they just didn't notice it was there. We'll be looking at his theories in more detail when we get to Olga of Kiev and the conversion of Rus. The outcome of all these arguments is that when we look at the tale of bygone years, we should not only be thinking about, did this happen, but why did the chronicler want us to think that it happened, or to think that it happened in this particular way rather than another. And of course, we should also remember that, however persuasive any reconstructions might be, at the end of the day they are still speculative, and the actual texts of the chronicles that we do have were written considerably later than the events of early Rus that they describe. So, we've talked about what Rus was, and we've talked about what the tale of bygone years was. Now let's talk about Rurik. I'm going to move through Rurik and the first couple of rulers fairly quickly. You can think of the two mini-series that we did on Before the Rus and Enter the Rus as giving you the overview of what's actually going on in this period, by which I mean between the first Scandinavian incursions into the East and the development of a Rus for which we have real records and evidence. As as far as the tale of bygone years and the events and rulers it lists for this period go, we are dealing with things that are probably largely legendary, possibly compound characters, distorted oral traditions, and so on. We do not have any direct evidence for a man called Rurik, although theories of his origins abound, so mainly we're going to talk about what this story is supposed to do. Cast your mind back again to the intro to the episode on the Normanists, which started with a reading describing how the people of an area somewhere in the northern forest invited a man called Rurik and his brothers to come and rule. We're not talking about Slavs. You'll recall that they had not yet migrated that far north. Rather, we have a whole collection of Finno-Ugrians and Bolts. According to the tale of bygone years, the reason for the invitation is that the peoples of the north had driven out the Varangians and were trying to rule themselves. They were not successful. There was chaos in the land. Somebody needed to bring order. So Rurik arrives, wherever he came from, probably Denmark or Sweden. He establishes domain based in Rurikova Gorodishin, Rurik's fort, later to become Novgorod. The Hypatian Chronicle says that first he set himself up at Stara Ladoga before moving to Novgorod. Later he dispatches a pair of warriors, Askold and Deer, to Constantinople. The Chronicle is clear that these are not relatives of Rurik, and therefore when they decided to stop on the way and conquer Kiev, they did not have legitimacy to rule. Rurik dies, and he is succeeded by his kinsman of some kind, Alec, who is succeeded by Rurik's son, Igor. 
The nature of the actual relationship between these three is also a matter of much conjecture and argument, but after them we are on much firmer ground with rulers of reliable historicity. We'll be looking at Alleg and Ego in the next episode. So if we break this down, we have a tale of brothers being invited to rule a kingdom, which is a fairly common trope in semi-legendary histories. In this podcast, you've already heard about the founding of Kiev by Ki and his brothers. Other Slavic cultures have similar foundation stories, and those of us from the English-speaking world might think of Hengist and Horsa, the Saxon leaders traditionally invited to settle in England to defend the local inhabitants. Let's just think of the evolution of the state for a minute. The first step towards government was when some guy decided that rather than working for his food, he could just beat his weaker neighbours and make them give him a share of their food. Maybe he would even take all of their food and then just let the workers in his little group have what he handed out to them. But this kind of pure oppression is not a sustainable model. People need reciprocation. If they are giving something up, they need to feel that they are getting something in return. So instead of the biggest couple of guys in the clan beating their own people and taking their stuff, they began to beat up people in other clans and take their stuff instead, and defend their own people against other clans trying to do the same to them. And then disputes would come up, and people would say, we need some kind of rules. So these strong men would say, these are the rules. If you follow these rules, we will protect and reward you. If you do not, we will beat you and take your stuff. I'm simplifying, but you get the picture. So what we end up with is a situation where the ruled and the ruler agree that the rule is legitimate if the ruler provides protection and order in exchange for living like a, well, king. A kind of social contract. And what we have in these legends of invited brothers is a legitimating origin story. Rather than a warlord turning up with a gang of warriors and taking over by violence, I rule because my great-great-grandfather gave you peace and order. In this story, the new rulers are acting out of benevolence, in an effort to help people, defending them or imposing order in a time of lawlessness and therefore fulfilling the functions seen as prerequisites for legitimate power, rather than taking over by violence. The names of these rulers are often also a clue to their legendary status. Hengist and Horsa mean horse and stallion, for instance, probably not their actual names. Rurik might seem like a bit of an unusual name, but actually you are almost certainly familiar with it in its other forms. Roderick, which arrived in English via the Normans, and Rodrigo in Spain and Portugal. Rurik derives through Old Norse from the Proto-Germanic Hrurix, which means famous or glorious king or ruler. Sinius and Truvor, his brothers, mean victor and trustworthy. So, glorious king, victor and trustworthy. I think you'll agree that these are practically ideal names for the legendary founder of a dynasty and his brothers. And that basically exhausts our knowledge of Rurik. We simply don't have the sources or archaeological evidence to confirm anything about him as an individual. We don't know whether there was an actual Rurik. We don't know where he came from. We don't know whether the Rus were actually invited to rule, or just invaded and imposed themselves on the locals. I know which one sounds more probable to me. Join me next episode, when we'll make the transition from legend to history. Thank you for listening. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.